you're such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is about the Blagg family murders. This is a case where a mother was found, but the daughter is still missing. A case with two disappearances, multiple witness statements, two felons confessions, and a verdict that was thrown out for a retrial 10 years later. All that led to the sentence of one man, a man the media had loved. By the way, if you don't know, it is my absolute passion to tell these stories and I mean no harm or disrespect when I do so. So if that is something that you would like to support me in doing, all you have to do is give this video a thumbs up. Make sure you are subscribed with the post notification bell on and leave a nice comment down below. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 2001 in Colorado and the Black family lived in Grand Junction. This was at 2253 Pine Terrace Court on Greenbelt Drive. This family consisted of 34-year-old Jennifer and her husband Mike as well as their daughter who was a six-year-old named Abby Jo. Jennifer had grown up in Oklahoma with her single mother and her brother named David and they were all extremely close. In fact, the two siblings would often play together and because they were, you know, a boy and a girl, David David would often play Barbies with her and she would play cars with him and they just really made it work and they were so loving towards one another. Jennifer grew up playing the piano, she loved to dance, and she was all around a really outgoing girl with tons of friends, but unfortunately, her innocent, carefree childhood ended when she was about 12 years old and a family friend, a male, who was much older than her, ended up sexually assaulting her. Jennifer did struggle quite a bit after this with confidence, with just safety in general, but she did move forward and she did a really good job at staying strong and she graduated high school and then decided to go on to college. Mike, her husband, had grown up with a family that moved quite a lot because his father was actually an Air Force colonel and his family lived on different Air Force bases. So they were always, you know, involved in these communities with the military families, but they didn't get to stay with them very often. And they were always leaving different places where they had made friends. So it was very hard for him to actually, you know, make these solid friends. But he was an incredibly well-behaved child who always got incredibly good grades and he was so smart and hardworking that he actually got into the governor's honor program and he went on to study nuclear engineering at Georgia Tech. While doing so it wasn't like he was handed these things he actually had to work very hard he was delivering pizzas and he was also enlisting in the Navy so that he could afford school. Around the age of 21 Mike did get married but this wasn't to Jennifer this was his first marriage which lasted about a year they both went their separate ways after that it just wasn't something that worked out they they married too young and it just ended up that they had to go their separate ways. But shortly after this is when Mike and Jennifer met. This was in 1988 when Jennifer was going to the National University to get her degree in business and Mike was still in the Navy and kind of moving around but had just been stationed in that same area. There had been this huge beach party that everyone was invited to and these two were invited because their friends were actually dating. So they knew someone who connected them both and as soon as they met they knew that it was going to be more than just friends Mike gave her his phone number and asked her out on a date and their first date was actually to go to the movies and then after that they just started dating consistently by 1991 they were married and four years afterwards they had a daughter named Abby the family were well-known Christians who were deeply religious and happy and loving Mike had even gotten a more stable job after his daughter was was born that way he could be with his wife and daughter. By 2001, the family had moved several different times and had landed in Grand Junction, Colorado because Mike had gotten a really decent job as an operations manager at a manufacturing plant called Amtec Inc. And he was also teaching Sunday school at the local church and he became a deacon there as well. 
They were a deeply religious family that prayed about every decision that they were going to make before they decided to make their final decision. And they even opened a chapter in the area and hired these prayer warriors to help out there. Their now six-year-old daughter named Abby was now at the age where she was going to first grade and she went to the Book Clift Christian School and Jennifer was also working there as a teacher's assistant when she wasn't at home doing the household chores. Now Jennifer had always been this sweet, caring, bubbly young woman and she really did pass that on to her daughter Abby. Abby Jo was said to be so incredibly outgoing that she would talk as long as somebody would listen to her and they actually had to excuse themselves if they wanted out of the conversation. But she was always on her best behavior and she had been brought up in churches and was just as religious as her parents. Mike was known to be a really hardworking man who always took the time to go home and be with his family and, you know, play with his daughter and give her a bedtime story right before bed. Yet on November 13th at 4.21 p.m., a tragedy would occur to this happy-go-lucky family. A 911 call was placed saying that something had happened at the Black family home and they believed it was a crime scene. And now the front door was open and there was blood inside. When investigators arrived at the scene, Mike Blagg was waiting outside for them. Now, he claimed he had just gotten home from work when he noticed that the door was ajar. He headed inside and he found a blood spatter on the master bedroom bed that was, it was not just a little bit of blood. There was a significant amount of blood on the actual mattress and then dripping down onto their white carpet. In the same room, a jewelry box had been tipped upside down and Jennifer's purse had also been dumped out on the floor and all of the contents were just everywhere. Both Jennifer and Abby were nowhere to be found and investigators immediately started looking for what they believed to be a killer. Yet Mike believed that they were still alive and he began begging the public for their help in returning his wife and daughter. Investigators got to work looking for them or their bodies. The Colorado River became a point of concern, whether it was in the water or on the banks. There were many people searching that entire area, but meanwhile, forensic investigators were working inside of the Black home to identify things like blood, fingerprints, and DNA and bring them in for testing. Neighbors claimed that the last time they had seen Jennifer and Abby alive was actually the day prior, right after school around 3 to 3.30 p.m. But the lone survivor of this family, Mike Blagg, was not being ruled out as prime suspect just yet because, of course, he is the male figure of a family that has gone missing. And there's also a sign that this could be a murder. So they were not going to cross him off just yet. And he was questioned. And he gave investigators kind of a timeline of what the family had been doing prior to disappearing. And he said that the night before, Abby had gone to bed at her usual time at around 7 p.m. And, you know, the parents stayed up a little bit later. And that is when Jennifer got a call from a friend at around 8 p.m. asking her if she wanted to go out for lunch. And so she had made plans with this friend. And around 10, Jennifer and Mike decided to go to bed. And he said that, you know, the next morning he woke up and Jennifer and Abby were still asleep. They kind of slept a little bit later than him because he woke up around 5.36 to go to work and they had to wake up around 6.30 to go to school. Now, Mike said he would usually call and talk to Jennifer throughout the day. And so he did so on November 13th as usual, but she did not answer. And he said he continued to try and she was still not picking up and he wasn't too worried because she did go out and do things. So sometimes she did didn't answer the phone and you know he didn't really think anything of it but when he got home from his shift at work he instantly knew something was wrong but someone also knew that something bad was going to happen to these two women because it was found that Abby's school had been called the day prior and told that she was not going to make it to school the next day this was an unidentified person. Nobody knows who called the school, but they do have record of them saying she was not going to make it. Now, voicemails were found from Mike to Jennifer that day, and he was saying things like, Hello, my beautiful bride. I hope you're out and about doing all kinds of cool and nifty things. I want you to the strength of the Holy Spirit, and I'm able to be standing, sitting here in front of you right now. Every fiber, every core member of my body, wants to scream out and shout and grab somebody by the neck and say, you did it, and tear a wound from the wind. 
we're talking about the two most important people in my life are missing right now. Someone had planned this and investigators began to believe more and more that Mike Blagg had done this. Mike, on the other hand, was denying any involvement and he even told the press that he was really bothered that he was still being looked into. He posted a reward for $3,000 for anybody with information, yet investigators decided to put him under surveillance anyway and it was a good thing that they did. This was mainly due to the fact that the blood inside the home did match Jennifer, but so did blood that they had found in the garage in the family's minivan. This was a maroon and gold 2000 Ford Windstar, and there had been blood on the steering wheel as well as in the back. Now, 55 fingerprints were found inside the home that included some that matched Mike as well as 17 unidentified, and six of those were said to be very small and were possibly Abby's. A month later, with no leads in their disappearances and these women still not being found, Mike moved out of the family home. He said it was just too hard to be inside the home and there was also blood still on the floor that he really hadn't cleaned and investigators, of course, had taken their time with, you know, making this a crime scene and looking through it. So he hadn't really had the time to clean it up. And so he then moved, he was looking for homes that would fit him as well as Abby and Jennifer. He was also going on the media and doing these news interviews saying that he believed that this was possibly a burglary gone wrong due to burglaries happening in the area around the time and throughout the year prior to their disappearance. I've got some great hopes that we're gonna find something out. Like you said, somebody knows something. Hopes that extend to the presents wrapped and waiting 39 days past Christmas. And you don't want to tell us what any of it is. I'm not going to tell you what any of it is. To the phone number never changed because six-year-old Abby knows it and may be able to call. I have certainly had many a time when I have just been completely out of control. Um, but I, I have also spent a lot of time in my Bible and uh, the Lord has given me a piece about this. You know that you're the first person who's a, sus a suspect and that you're probably still an active suspect. I feel like that has to be the case because uh, I've been told that in, in excess of 90% of the time, it's a family member or someone close to the family that would do this sort of thing. Did you have anything to do with their disappearance? No, I had nothing to do with their disappearance. And it's, it's strange to me to think that anybody could do anything like what apparently happened here. But if you've seen either one of these two beautiful, beautiful people, if you would please get in touch with the Mesa County Sheriff's Department. Pink was her favorite color, it is her favorite color. Mike also told everyone that he bought these Christmas presents for Jennifer and Abby and hoped that they would be home to open them. Everyone really felt so bad for Mike because he was not only grieving, but he was also being looked into as their possible killer. But it appeared as though the burglaries that Mike was referring to weren't the only thieves in the area. You see, when under surveillance, Mike was allegedly found to have stolen a shredder and a table from his job, which were worth over $500. Now, by February, this was now in 2002, four months after the disappearances, Mike was brought in to be asked about his, you know, robbery of his job and might be in crying. And he was then asking about the penalties of murder categories, even though they weren't talking about murder or a disappearance at all. He then asked for an attorney and left soon after not having to talk to investigators. But the next day, investigators would get a call saying that Mike was actually at the hospital. Now he was in serious condition after cutting his wrists and attempting to take his own life. A suicide note was found at his residence that said that he had no knowledge of Abby and Jennifer's disappearances and he was released from the hospital a week later and began looking for a new job. Now, unfortunately, due to the harsh winter, because they did disappear in November and this was in Colorado, the search for them or their bodies was put off until the next spring. During this time, an anonymous tip was sent in saying that they had seen the black minivan near Park Ridge 
on the day they vanished. This was only about 11 minutes from their home and the caller was asked to call back the next spring when they could actually look for them. This caller called multiple different times to make sure that the investigators were taking this tip seriously, but by April, investigators were finally able to go out to search again. This time they focused on the 45 mile radius around the home and they took 11 days looking through this area, but unfortunately nothing was found. Yet they didn't give up. By June, they were going to search the Mesa County landfill. Now, this was revealed to the public and strangely enough, Mike left the state after this and told nobody, including police, where he was going. On June 5th, in the landfill, Jennifer Blagg was found deceased. She was wrapped up in a red and black tint and had been shot in the left eye where the bullet was still lodged into her skull. She had then been dumped with the trash. Now, after further investigating, investigators found that different areas of this landfill were marked for different companies. These big companies would come with a whole bunch of trash and they would have to actually sign something saying that it was their company that were dumping the trash and where to go. And so they knew the different companies in this area. And one of those companies turned out to be Mike Blagg's last employer that he stole from. They began searching even harder in this area for Abby Blagg's body, but they came back empty-handed and with a body and a connection to a possible killer, investigators now had a reason to arrest Mike, so they decided to come back to look for Abby and go and find Mike to arrest him. The problem was, they didn't know where he was. Upon hearing that a body had been found in a certain landfill, an ex-coworker of Mike's came forward to say that around the time the girls disappeared, he had seen Mike at work disposing of the bodies, but he didn't know that that was what he was doing until now. He saw Mike pushing a pallet jack with two large cardboard boxes, which he discarded on the loading deck that went to the trash compactor, but he asked if Mike needed any help and Mike was normally the one to say, yeah, of course, but he immediately refused the offer quite aggressively and told him to go away. Now the autopsy revealed that Jennifer had been shot at close range, but it also revealed she had been asleep when she was killed because she had a retainer in her mouth that she only ever wore to bed. Dental records confirmed that this was in fact Jennifer Blagg and while searching for Mike, investigators found that his mother lived in Georgia. Sure enough, he was staying there and when they arrived at his home and he was arrested, he was taken back to Colorado and charged with first degree murder. Meanwhile, search teams went back to this landfill for the next seven weeks to search for Abby and lay her to rest with her mother. But after looking through 7,000 tons of trash, they still had no sightings of Abby. This is when it was revealed to the public that this was not the perfect family like everyone believed. And although Mike's first wife had said, you know, nothing had happened, he wasn't abusive, he wasn't angry, nothing out of the ordinary happened with Mike, they just didn't want to be together anymore. It appeared as though Mike and Jennifer had kind of had arguments from the very beginning. Mike had been one to party often and Jennifer wasn't used to that life or willing to participate in it. And so she gave Mike an ultimatum party or be with her. And eventually he decided that he wanted to be with her. And then after this, you know, they got married, they had a kid, everything was going well for a while. And then he began to get shipped out with the Navy and they spent very little time together. In fact, Jennifer was all alone when Abby was born and she began to struggle with postpartum depression after this and was still trying to take care of Abby while he was away. This wasn't necessarily his fault. He was in the Navy but it strained their relationship greatly. So when he finally did decide to take a more normal job, he also began working as a Sunday school teacher, like I said, and that is when he was talking to teens during the Sunday school and they began to say that he was saying very inappropriate things and he ended up getting fired. You see, he was teaching them about abortion and sexuality and his own very conservative views on the topics. The family, 
I was also having money troubles during this time because they had just moved to Grand Junction and their last home in South Carolina was not selling. And once it did, they lost about $8,000. And Jennifer's friends back in South Carolina said that she didn't really want to move to Colorado at all. And she would often call them saying that she missed them, but she loved the fact that Mike was happy at his job. So she was willing to stay in Colorado. But according to a tip coming in, Things were much darker than even that because an employee at legal services claimed that Jennifer had come in a few days prior to her disappearance saying that she needed to talk to an attorney and when she was denied they couldn't get to her that day, she left very distraught and never came back. Jennifer was allegedly telling the employee that she was being abused by her husband and wanted a divorce. She then was refused help and a few days later she was gone. When Mike's computer was searched, the smiles of this perfect family was even further unmasked because Mike had been found to use an escort service. He also had 13,000 explicit pictures on his computer. Another tip was brought in from this escort service saying that Mike visited there several times monthly to get massages from topless women. When Mike was questioned about all of this, he said that Jennifer knew because they were having a sexual problem and so he was just doing research search for that. Then when more came out, he admitted that he was addicted to this explicit website and he got Jennifer to watch it with him to educate themselves. But Jennifer's diary showed a woman who was deeply religious and constantly praying, working on her relationship with God. But she also talked about her, how her health was failing and Mike was being distant. And investigators also found a note inside of a book she was reading that talked about a recent fight that she and Mike had had. Investigators began to believe that this murder was premeditated and that Jennifer had been abused by her husband. They also believed that Abby had been killed after possibly hearing or seeing something that Mike didn't want her to. And Mike then did what he believed had to be done. However, Abby's blood was found nowhere inside the home or the van. Now, prosecutors decided against seeking the death penalty because they did not have Abby's body, and Mike was also released on bond to live with his mother while awaiting trial. That's when they found that these Christmas presents that Mike had been telling the media about that he had gotten for Jennifer and Abby were really expensive gifts he had bought for himself. This was totaling around $5,500 in technology for him. In March of 2004, Mike's trial began and prosecutors claimed that Jennifer was killed because she wanted out of the marriage and Mike did not want to lose that control over her. That Mike killed her and possibly Abby and took them into their van before dumping them at his job and going back to the home to stage a home invasion. Prosecution said the killer had known Jennifer intimately well and Jennifer's mother even testified saying that Mike had abused Jennifer before he was drunk and he choked her. Uh, the loss of two children at one time, nothing compares. And I hope no one else in this room ever experiences it. Now, an FBI agent for the prosecution named Ron Walker said he believed Jennifer was the primary target. But investigators said that they tried not to believe that the father was the killer because of that stigma, but everything pointed to him. Now, the defense also hired an FBI agent or a former FBI agent named John Larson to testify that a predator broke into the black home to target Abby and that this wasn't the first time this killer had done so. John, the FBI agent, said that their home was right next to a service road and he claimed that after Mike left work, this predator entered the home. He then hauled Jennifer's body over the back privacy fence and loaded her into the vehicle waiting for him. But the prosecution said that this wasn't a service road behind their home. It was a regular road next to a school and it would have been hard to do anything in broad daylight without somebody seeing them. John ended up saying he was unaware that it wasn't a service road and that it was, you know, nearby a school, but he still believed that someone had killed Jennifer and kidnapped Abby and that the real killer had staged the crime to make it look like Mike, the father, had done it. The defense also had a theory that the kill could have been a case of mistaken identity as the neighbor of the Braggs had a child who was being stalked. They said that the stalker could have, you know, thought this was the home of the child he was looking for and accidentally killed 
the wrong one. Mike did not testify and after 12 hours of deliberation, Mike was found guilty on April 16th of 2004 and sentenced to life in prison. However, this wouldn't be the end. You see, 10 years later, he was granted a retrial. His attorneys had been trying to find a way to get him out for years and they had once said that one of the jurors was blind, so they were unable to see the exhibits, but this was denied for a retrial. But then in 2014, it came out that a juror had actually lied on the jury questionnaire. And this was a woman named Marilyn Charlesworth, who said she was not a victim of domestic abuse. And yet many years later, she testified about domestic violence to the city council. That June, because of this, Mike's conviction was thrown out and the Colorado Supreme Court granted prosecutors an emergency stay to keep him in prison while awaiting this next trial. The defense then began to produce an entirely different suspect who was a sex offender from Montana named Mr. B, but the judge ruled against them, you know, coming forward with another suspect altogether when investigators had never talked about this. A search warrant for Mr. B turned up a note with a list of alleged victims, including Jennifer and Abby Blagg. Blagg's attorneys say additional evidence that linked this Mr. B to the crime is a Gucci watch that he gave to his wife. That watch may be the same watch that Jennifer Blagg owned. Blagg's attorneys say that Mr. B has confessed to killing a dozen girls but has never been charged with those crimes. And according to Blagg's attorney, Mr. B discussed going to Colorado in November 2001 for Army National Guard training, the same time frame of the crime. At the second trial, which happened in 2018, the prosecution brought in crime scene reconstructionist expert Iris Daly, who said that the items that had been thrown all over the ground were calculated and consistent with staging. Iris said that it appeared as though Jennifer had been shot under the covers and kept in the bed while she was bleeding until her heart stopped. That is when she was carried out through the garage door and put into the back of the van. The Black's family doctor testified and he said that Jennifer only ever came in talking about her low libido and Mike would come in to be treated for insomnia. Jennifer's best friend, Edith Melson, then testified saying that she talked to her on the phone about once a week and about 10 days prior to her disappearance, they had a phone call where Jennifer appeared to be very upset and asked Edith to pray for her. She also said that her and Abby were planning a visit and that is when Edith also mentioned that she remembers the tent that Jennifer's body was found in because it was in the Blagg's garage when they were in South Carolina. She really remembered this tent because she had teased Jennifer about it because Jennifer loved camping and she didn't. Mike decided to testify at this trial and he was said to speak with very little emotion. He was directly asked if he killed Jennifer and he said no. He said he loved her with all his heart. He then said there was not a whole lot of emotional outpouring in my family as I was growing up. Mainly, we just kind of internalized it. We didn't really express our grief very much. Even to this day, I do the same sorts of thing. I hold it in and I don't express my feelings very well. He went on to say that he knew something was very wrong when Abby didn't run up to greet him when he got home from work that day and he didn't smell his wife making dinner. Now, State Senator Ray Scott said that he lived right next to the Blacks. He could see into their home and his dog actually began to bark like crazy at the fence that night, like very early in the morning around 1, 2 a.m. and would not stop. He was having such a fit. Another neighbor also testified saying around 1.30, she was woken up by a loud noise and that her dog then began to continuously bark as well. Now, Mike was found guilty once again, sentenced to life in prison, and this was at the Colorado Territorial Correctional Facility. First degree murder after deliberation. We, the jury, find the defendant, Michael Blagg, guilty of first degree murder after deliberation. Now, the identity of the possible suspect that the defense wanted to bring forward, named Mr. B, was revealed to be a man named Philip Brunsma. Now, he was known to be a sex offender who was currently serving two 100-year sentences for distribution of explicit photos of children and the sexual assault of multiple children. He was caught after posting on an online message board offering to basically trade images. And then he was emailing offering these children up for sexual relations. When the FBI raided his home, they raided his vehicles and storage locker. He was found with a note with a whole bunch of names on it. 
a note that allegedly had Jennifer and Abby's names on it, their birthdays, as well as the dates of the abduction. Philip's wife had also gotten a watch around this time that was Gucci, just like the one Jennifer had. However, the judge in the second trial didn't want this theory taken away from the evidence against Mike, and so they refused to allow it in court. But for the victims who testified at Philip's trial, they talked about how much pain he put them through and how they had nightmares and turned to drugs and wanted him to be haunted by the victims for the rest of his life. It was also found that another felon named Thomas Fury had come forward claiming that he had seen Abby three days after she vanished at a gas station in Utah. He said that he was with a woman on a cross-country joyride in a stolen vehicle when he noticed a woman at the gas station with Abby because she had big breasts and blonde hair and he said that they got into a dark blue Chevy sedan with an American flag decal on the back. He was arrested a day after this and he saw Abby's picture on the wall of this missing girl and then told investigators he had seen her. He said that while she was with them, she appeared to have a red face like she had been crying. However, the woman with Thomas came forward saying that he was lying about what he saw and she never saw anything. But Abby is still missing to this day and she would be 26 years old. Her father was never charged in her disappearance, but it is believed that this is now a murder investigation for her as well. A tip did come in from a woman saying that she had seen the Blagg's van the night of the disappearance on Little Park Road, which is this long stretch through, you know, the mountains, through an area that has nothing else. And some theorized that Mike actually buried his daughter out there to give her more of a proper burial after killing her and not wanting to, after he just dumped Jennifer. However, then why did he have two boxes at his job that he was dumping into the trash compactor? But Abby's body was never found there. Nobody has ever found her body or evidence of murder, so some say maybe he did just kill Jennifer, knew he was going to be caught for it, and then had her given to a new family but nothing more has been done about her disappearance. It's like after Jennifer was given her justice, she was forgotten about. So if you know anything, please call the Mesa County Sheriff's Office at 970-244-3500. But do you believe Mike did this to his wife and daughter? Or do you believe a random killer did this to the family? Was possibly Abby being targeted instead? Do you believe poor Abby was murdered? Or is there still a chance of finding her alive? Don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Don't forget that I post tons of videos just like this. If you wanna watch the last video I uploaded, it will be right here. A playlist of my videos will be here. If you wanna to subscribe to this channel, click here. If you want to subscribe to my vlog channel, click here. Okay, bye.